So, I was about halfway through making this video when this image got posted online, and now this seems really well timed. We're going to be going back to Zendikar. Now this time it's only going to be for one set, as Wizards has abandoned all structure and we're going to stay on a plane as long as it seems fitting, which honestly I think is a great idea. But are people actually excited to be returning to Zendikar? Well there seem to be two distinct camps. Those who really want to go back and those that hate Zendikar. Frankly, I think that split mostly comes down to which version of Zendikar you played more. Those around during OG Zendikar, myself included, tend to really like the plane, and those introduced through Battle for Zendikar, who played more during then, want to stay away, rightfully so. I would honestly say Battle for Zendikar and Oath of the Gatewatch are the worst magic sets of the modern era. Now I know that's a weighty statement and I'm prepared to defend my position, but it's gonna be a two-parter here. First, in this video, I'm going to defend why I really enjoyed the original Zendikar and what I think made it so unique and interesting as well as providing some context to those who weren't around during the original set. In part two, I'm going to be diving more into Oath of the Gatewatch and Battle for Zendikar, and actually talking about what the flaws are in there, and how I think it pales in comparison to the original. So stay tuned for that. Zendikar dropped in 2009, followed by Worldwake and Rise of the Eldrazi, making up the original Zendikar block. Within these three sets is an exciting and adventurous plane packed full of powerful cards. Going through each of the sets, the block follows a sort of three-act structure, setup, rising action, into climax. Along this journey is card design and mechanical flavor that synergizes at each point while also creating fun and interesting gameplay. The three-act structure is used in most of the three set blocks, but I figured I would use it to more fluidly transition between each of the sets. So at this point, Zendikar has never been featured in a set before, and we're getting introduced through nothing but the cards themselves right now. So, what can we tell right away? Well, let's start by looking at the lands. The basic lands of a plane are a great way to show off some fantastic art, as well as introduce unique aspects of a plane and establish its environment. I mean, take a look at this swamp from Lorwyn. Compared to, well, most other swamps, the rare inclusion of color in the Lorwyn art already is communicating something unique to this plane, of its universal but ultimately deceptive beauty. So what do we learn from Zendikar basics? Well, for one thing, they're full art, and right away this shows us that mana and the land of Zendikar is central to the plane's identity. Within the images, we can see large masses of rocks and hedrons floating in the sky showing an abnormal gravity of Zendikar. The hedrons themselves are suggestive of the presence of something or someone powerful and mysterious. Within the other images, we can also see just how harsh the terrain is, and that it seems to be in a fairly constant state of turmoil, destroying and recreating itself repeatedly. Then what is life like on Zendikar? Well, some of the lands show glimpses into this. Small encampments and temporary colonies seem to be the most prevalent. It's clear that at some point there was most likely larger civilizations, or some other way of life on the plane, but as we currently see, all of these civilizations have disappeared and their cities are in ruins. No one on Zendikar is living a life of luxury, and most of its people seem to be fairly nomadic as the shifting lands make domestic life a reality few will receive. Each color has a representative race that are all seeking different things, but they all fall into similar lives of exploration, survival, and discovery. The white-aligned core are nomadic and spiritual. They are in an almost constant state of pilgrimage, making arduous journeys to visit the ancient ruins of Zendikar that they seem to have some sort of relation to, as stated on Core Cartographer. The blue-aligned merfolk stay within the sea, and their quest is for ancient knowledge. The black-aligned vampires seem to be the least interested in discovery, with all the adventurers wandering around Zendikar, they have easy access to pick off and feast upon the ill-prepared. The goblins of Zendikar are a mountain-dwelling group, as most goblins are, but because of this they are often employed as cheap mountain guides for those unfamiliar with the mountains. But of course, if you think hiring a goblin as a guide is a good idea, well, you probably deserve whatever happens. The elves seem to be the most diverse as far as their motivations go. Some are simply adventurers, seeking less hostile land to inhabit, and some, such as the Moldaya elves, seem to have a more spiritual connection to the world. But one thing is for sure, they're all good at surviving. Zendikar also has humans. Humans fall within all colors, and they don't really have any of the specialized skills the other races have to help survive in the wild, and that's why humans have to band together to survive. Enter the ally mechanics. Allies are a creature type that gets stronger whenever there are more allies on your board or more allies entering the battlefield. They're a band of adventurers, and each ally brings different strengths to the party. It's an interesting way of introducing multicolored support within a monocolored block, showing how different races on the plane can unite. I really enjoy the concept of ally mechanics, and this in combination with the questing and adventuring on Zendikar gives me the same light fantasy feeling that I often look for in D&D. 
Speaking of quests and awkward transitions, quests are enchantments that gain quest counters from doing things like laying lands, casting creatures, or dealing damage. When you get enough quest counters, you can reap the benefits of completing the quest. These quests were varied too. Some were just delayed tutors, some are token generators, and others have permanent lasting effects once they're online. The quests lead to some interesting choices while you're playing. Doing certain things to ensure you get a quest counter is an interesting challenge, and the quests that you have to sacrifice to get the award also allow for some interesting strategy. Take for example once you've got your quest for the Gravelord active. You can activate it whenever you want, but you can also hold it up and try to trick an opponent into a bad attack, or activate it at the end of their turn to dodge sorcery speed removal and then also get a hidden. They lead to some interesting play patterns. I'm a big fan of quests. They're an interesting design space for enchantments and telling a story. Something that I don't think was topped until the release of Dominaria's Sagas. Sagas really take the storytelling aspect and kick it up a notch, with incremental story beats and a beautiful new frame. While we didn't get a new subtype for quests, there was a new subtype created in Zendikar to fit with the perils of the adventures, trap cards. Trap cards are a subset of instants that get a reduced casting cost, or sometimes free casting, if an opponent did certain things to activate the trap. These are definitely flavorful, showing that the secrets of Zendikar are being guarded not only by the dangers of the natural plane, but also guarded by those who hid them. Sadly, most of the effects aren't that great outside of Limited, and even the cost reduction isn't always enough to make them playable. But some do see fringe play. In other mechanics, we have the return of Kicker. While Kicker doesn't necessarily fit thematically with Zendikar more than any other plane, it is just an all-around solid mechanic that strengthens the set, especially for limited. Kicker is great, because if you get a card with Kicker early game, you can just cast it and use it. But if you were to draw it later once you have more mana, you can vest the extra mana for a boosted effect, so when you're getting it later in the game, it's not the same effect, it suddenly now has adjusted to the state of the game that you're in. It leads to less draws and limited where you're left feeling like your deck is just stacked against you. And I'd say Kicker is in the S tier of limited mechanics, up there with cycling and flashback. The final mechanic we are introduced to in Zendikar is Landfall, a brand new mechanic that is the final punctuation in just how important lands are to this plane. Landfall is an ability word that tells you this ability is going to trigger whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control. Now I get that this can feel a little bit one-sided sometimes, and it might feel like your creatures only have abilities during your turn, Zendikar did have ways to get lands into play during your opponent's turns. One of the best being these bad boys. Enemy fetch lands. It took seven years, but wizards finally completed the cycle of fetch lands. Now I don't know how bad people were dying for these back in the day, but it's pretty hard to imagine formats without them. Then again, it's hard to imagine formats like Modern with them, given their current price tag. Jokes aside, these were great cards to include in the set, and they fit excellently within Zendikar. It's a set that is one of the best introductions to a plane, as well as being a super solid magic set with loads of value in it. While it doesn't introduce some big overarching story, it sets up hints of what's to come. What happened to this ancient civilization of Zendikar? These questions are intriguing and ominous, my favorite being this hint of what's to come a colossal and bizarre monument that grants incredible power to those who discover it, but at a cost. At the time, this is the first mention of Eldrazi, quoted with a simple flavor text, Gods don't die, they merely slumber. Yeah, but that's only one card out of 249, it's probably nothing. Time to move on to more light adventuring fun. Also, I almost forgot to mention it, but during the original print run of Zendikar, to help promote the idea of treasure hunting and exploration, Wizards inserted random priceless treasures into booster packs. What these were, were old cards. They were um, pieces of power, they were reserved cards, they were dual lands. Uh, and randomly, these old cards would be inserted into your Zendikar booster packs. It's honestly a brilliant way to promote the set, and gets people really excited for opening up booster packs. And it's super cool to have the potential to open super rare cards inside your booster packs. Kind of reminds me of something else. So, World Wake as a set is probably most well known for having some powerhouse cards. The most notable being... This name is an incantation, one that incites rhetoric driven by troubled memories. Jace the Mind Sculptor is alluring and infamous. And for seven years, it has been the boogeyman of magic. Whoops, now he's unbanned. 
Oh, hey, look, they just unbanned Stormforge Mystic, too. It's kind of funny looking back at how much drama there was around Jace the Mind Sculptor as the Boogeyman. Now it's sort of a thing of the past. The game changes and new answers make old threats much less imposing. And now he's unbanned in modern and definitely not a scourge of the format. But still, when this guy was printed, he was a menace. I mean, not just in extended formats, but this guy was standard legal. If you think playing against Teferi is awful, imagine playing against Jace the Mind Sculptor in standard. Stunforge wouldn't be too much of a nuisance in standard until the swords were printed in Scars of Mirrodin. But eventually both cards did rightfully get the ban hammer. But let's not worry about that. We're in World Wake, post Zendikar, pre, well, a lot of mistakes. All Stoneforge Mystic currently is, is a flavorful way to tutor up some really cool equipment. Mechanically, World Wake is pretty much the same as Zendikar. Kicker has now evolved into Multi-Kicker, which is a slight variation on the old mechanic. It's not terribly unique, but isn't quite as silly as Megamorph. As far as what's happening story-wise, things are becoming a bit more dicey. While the land was shown to be previously chaotic, it has now begun to tear itself apart. These manlands were the first multicolor manlands ever printed, and they were the first in quite a bit of time. They're called manlands because they're lands that can temporarily become creatures. There was also the Zendikon cycle, which shows the lands becoming animate. Basically, the earth is starting to churn and not just shift around and destroy itself, but it's becoming animate, possibly even thinking and feeling. So why exactly is this happening? Well, within the set, there's a few suggestions. In Terra Eternal, the flavor text states, If this world could make a wish, it would be to survive the parasites who loot its treasures and threaten its life force. Suggesting that it is becoming animate to fight back against the adventurers looking to pillage the land for secrets and wealth. Rolling Tide suggests maybe the land is shifting and crumbling for the emergence of some unknown entity. It doesn't say for sure, but chances are the next set's gonna make it clear. World Wake is significantly smaller than the other two Zendikar sets, having about a hundred less cards than either of them. But tonally, the cards are building an unease that wasn't conveyed in Zendikar. Sure, there was plenty of danger and treachery present before, but World Wake feels more unsettling. There's not a crazy amount of flavor text in the set, but what there is definitely conveys this feeling. My absolute favorite being from Amulet of Vigor. After years of study, I've learned an important lesson. The relics we watch may be watching us back. World Wake starts to take what we thought was a very simple and understandable plane and start to turn that on its head a bit, making you question all the things that you thought you understand about this world. The last card I want to focus on is Eye of Ugin. Now I can understand people not noticing Eldrazi Monument. There were a lot of cards in Zendikar and it wasn't necessarily that odd, but Eye of Ugin is just too intriguing to ignore. Think back. This is before anyone had seen a single Eldrazi, and we get a mythic rare land that doesn't even tap for mana. All it does is reduce the cost of colorless Eldrazi spells, and it can search up colorless creature cards. This really got people talking about what on earth the Eldrazi could be. It's fun to go back and read the discussions around when it was first spoiled. Some people even thought it was fake. Many people thought it was just outright awful, but no one really knew what to actually expect of it, because no one had seen the Eldrazi yet. An eye closes... A race awakens. When we return in the final set, Zendikar's ultimate secret has been discovered. As the eye closed, the Eldrazi were free from their prison. The Eldrazi, monstrosities born of the blind eternities, an entity focused solely on gorging themselves on a plane's mana until there is nothing left to extract. Rise of the Eldrazi is an absurdly satisfying and cool reveal to the secrets of Zendikar. The fun adventuring plane has finally cracked under its stresses, and the land gives birth to the multiverse's incomprehensible monsters. Gone are the days of lighthearted adventuring. The allies are nowhere in sight, and in their place are soldiers, warriors, and knights. The people of Zendikar have been forced very quickly to adapt and prepare themselves for a war they cannot win. Gameplay-wise, we see a total shift in playstyle as well, as things slow way down. The level up mechanic is the first indication of this. With enough investment, you can turn someone wholly unprepared for this conflict into someone more equipped to face the oncoming horde. This is a patient mechanic, needing a lot of mana or a couple of turns to fully get your investment out of it. We're not swinging in as quickly as the other Zendikar sets, and now we've moved to more of a slugfest. Totem Armor is also another mechanic that shows the fortification and patience within Rise of the Eldrazi. These enchantments give your creature an extra layer of safety, where they would normally be destroyed. Also, Totem Armor is a good way of making auras more useful. Often auras can be a bit frustrating as they can lead to a lot of two-for-ones, where you enchant a creature only to have it removed, and now suddenly you're behind two cards. 
Totem Armor is a good way of mitigating it as being an extra layer of protection, leading to less situations like this. It's also the reason why a lot of pretty underwhelming Auras have become cantrips lately. It's a good way of having less feel-bad moments, while also not breaking the format by only drawing one card. Rebound is a mechanic I don't quite get flavor-wise. My only guess is that it's representing how magic and mana is getting distorted by the Eldrazi. It's a pretty powerful mechanic, getting a repeat of your spell for free, and because of that it wasn't put on that many cards, making it also harder to evaluate. But let's talk about the Eldrazi. Mostly, I want to talk about their design and art direction, because here's the thing. I think that if we'd been introduced to the Eldrazi as they're presented in Battle and Oath of the Gatewatch, I don't think they'd be nearly as popular as they are. Rise of the Eldrazi, which I'll be further referring to as Row, features only 19 cards bearing the Eldrazi type line. Of those, only 15 are creatures. Battle for Zendikar has 51 Eldrazi creatures, and yet most of them are forgettable. I'll get more into what goes wrong in the next video, but I will say that I think the thing Battle for Zendikar forgets is simplicity. The Eldrazi in Row are easy to understand, and you spend less time trying to comprehend them, and more time believing them as actual beings. Here's the hierarchy. At the bottom are the spawn, that exist only to scuttle about as blockers and get sacrificed to ramp into larger things. Above them are the brood lineage. This group can be found in Jund colors, and they bring with them more spawn to help feed the larger Eldrazi. Then there is the lineage I would call the Goliaths. These Goliaths are huge and intimidating, but still not at the top of the totem pole. At this level, the colorless nature of Eldrazi is really shown. This is something that was completely new at the time. Before now, we'd only had colorless artifact creatures. And to show how unworldly the Eldrazi were, these giants were stripped of any color. It's honestly really flavorful, too, to what the Eldrazi are doing. These are world-consuming entities. To them, they're not interested in the kind of mana that they're consuming, only that there's a lot of it and that they can devour it all. Above the Goliaths are their masters, the three Eldrazi Titans, Kozilek, Ulamog, and Emrakul. Their designs are awesome. Their cards are awesome. I know everyone really, really likes Emrakul, but honestly my favorites are Kozilek and Ulamog. Mostly for the art. Alexei Briclow, probably saying that wrong, and Michael Komark's art is just stunning. I love how well these two pieces pair together. Both stand alone with nothing but the open sky behind them. Ulamog, cast against the sunset, his chest aglow almost as if he's absorbing the energy of the sun itself. Kozilek standing amidst a midday sky, his height dwarfing the mountains around him, and the birds looking like flies before him. This sense of scale is present within all the larger Eldrazi cards. Look at all his dust. This card is stunning, and perfectly shows the godlike power these beings possess. As you look in horror at the horizon, the sun is obscured by the Goliath, and with a mere movement of its hand, the earth before you is obliterated, reduced to nothing but ash. All the Eldrazi arts really nail it in my opinion. The only piece that I think is kinda weak is Ulamog's Crusher, which I think helps highlight what works well in the other art. The skyline of the trees is a little bit too high, making it not feel that imposing and still trapped by the wilds of Zendikar. Notice how the others rise above it. I really think that the art is honestly amazing for these Eldrazi. Some of the best artwork in all of Magic as far as any creatures are concerned. But not only is the art imposing, they were also given absurdly powerful design. The largest Eldrazi get one of the most powerful mechanics to date, Annihilator. It's an incredibly simple mechanic, but it leads to some difficult choices. Whenever a creature with Annihilator attacks, the defending player must sacrifice a number of permanents equal to the level of Annihilator on the creature. What better way to illustrate the destructive force of these creatures than by making everything you control vulnerable to their path of destruction? The rest of the art featuring the Eldrazi is fantastic as well. Things are looking bleak, and it's going to take a miracle to save this plane. And that's kind of where the block ends. The plane is in shambles, its inhabitants are working to fight back, but the situation looks dire. Where will things go next? Well, we can only wait to see. Except now we did see, and the highly anticipated return was... complicated at best. In my next video, I'm going to be highlighting what I think went wrong with Battle for Zendikar and Oath of the Gatewatch. If you're watching this in the future, it will be on screen right now. If it's not linked right now, well then stay tuned, because it'll be going up as soon as I can finish it. This video took me a while to make, but this is a topic I'm very passionate about, and I appreciate all the support as I continue to talk about magic cards. Thank you everyone for watching, and uh, catch you in the next one.